introduce our next speakers, uh, Elena Koja and Elena Jones. Hi everyone, I'm Elena Koja. And I'm Alexa Jones. And we had our summer research at Winthrop University with myoclonal flatworms. We did a dietary analysis and a discovery and description of a new species. So our research was separated into two main groups, the first of which was predatory flatworm diets. So these flatworms are predatory, so they have their own prey, and they live in interstitial or sand environments, and it's really hard to observe them within these environments. So since we can't directly observe these in the sand due to it being an opaque substrate and we have microscopic specimens, we are actually going to DNA extract and sequence their drug contents since we can't officially put them in an artificial environment for research viability. So we sequence these flatworm gut contents to identify the prey species within their stomachs, and this will help us understand biodiversity of the beach ecosystem. So what was our overall process? We used a couple of different rounds of DNA extraction, PCR, and gel. So we would first run PCRs with general uh, primers, then we would run introidal primers, send these, this amplification off to DNA sequencing, which was at an, exter at an external lab, we would then um, align these sequences, and if we got good and viable sequences, we would go ahead to prey primers to analyze what exactly was in this flatworm, so in the flatworm gut. And then we'd finally process that for DNA and send it off to find out what exactly was in there. So as we said, this starts with DNA extraction. We were not actually involved in the collection of the specimens, but here on the bottom right, you can see this is what a flatworm looks like under a microscope before we extract its DNA. And we actually ran into some problems with our processes, so we collected these specimens right outside our lab and practiced DNA extraction on them with our samples um, to figure out what was wrong. Our next step was running PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. So we would initially run it with primers Tim A and Tim B. This would allow us to isolate the 18S ribosomal sequence, which is what we would be using to compare the flatworms as well as the prey. So then we would run through a second round of PCR, which once again, we would have a forward primer, such as Tim A, and a reverse primer, 1100R, which would run along and sequence part of the flatworm. Then we would do this again with HNRV and 600F, and we do the second round of PCR just to make sure that we have sequenced what we want from the predatory flatworm. After each round of PCR, we would run gel electrophoresis. Now, within this gel, we have two separate samples. Um, SBGN002 and STR01, and we can see through this gel and the stark white bands that are appearing with the samples that we received a good amount of amplification. We also have a ladder on the side. Ladders are normally used to identify base pair length, and we actually used it to just ensure that our gels were running correctly, even if we didn't see any amplification. So once we ran through all of this DNA amplification of the flatworm, we would make sure that we actually have just DNA before we send off our specimens to the outside lab to be sequenced. So meniluting is just a form of purifying that DNA to make sure we only have the flatworm predator and the prey inside of its stomach. This is the mess that we get back. So because of the internal primers that we used, we would get a bunch of short sequences. We would have to align all of these sequences into one long sequence so that we know that we have the correct sequence as well as that there's not too much clutter in, within the sequence. So right there you can see where we have it aligned to where all of the nucleotides, the different colors, are aligned and then in some regions over here that's not as clear. So when we see that these bands are not very clear, that means that we probably have a stuffed specimen, which means that we have a lot of predator and prey sequences which are jumbling up our DNA. So we take one of these stuffed specimens and we run it through a prey primer PCR which is where we take one of these forward and reverse primers, which are small sequences from a prey, and we see if this will attach and amplify onto the predator, meaning that it is inside of the gut contents. So we would put a bunch of a total of 25 combinations on every single predator, with such as Neem 101 and then Harp Red 2, and we would just have a lot of different combinations to see what was happening. So an example of these results, just one of our samples was LEH202, which stands for Lycardia, and so each one of these green bands means that this showed up in a gel electrophoresis and we had a white band, which means that these prey sequences stuck to and were amplified within the predator, which means that this is in the gut contents. So here you can see a lot of diatoms and tricks were eaten. And so over here, this is a general picture of what the genus of these microscopic prey look like. So we ate a lot of diatoms and gastrotrichs within this species.
Our second part of research. We were actually able to describe and name a species of flatworm as they're not there that they're not there there are not many that are currently described and named. So hopefully that description will be getting published either later this year or early next year. So we named our new species Lehargus bivalis after the spiral shape of the canis violet, which is one of the main differences to tell that we have a different species. So over here you can see the taxonomy. This is part of the genus Lehardia, where there are currently three other described specimens species and we are adding a fourth. So what was our main tool used to analyze the anatomy of these flatworms? We used confocal imaging. Confocal imaging would allow us to dye our specimens with different fluorescent dyes and then go through and analyze them and we could actually see the target, so each dye would have a different target structure and we can see where the concentration of these target structures are as well as the, la as well as the layer of the different dyes to compare and contrast where the concentrations are. So the first example over here is Psi 3, and we're gonna turn off the lights so you can see this fluorescent image really quick. Mm. This will stain tubulin red. So tubulin is a part of the cytoskeleton, um, such as microtubules within the cells, or it can be part of cilia that are outside the cells we can see here. Our second dye was Alexa 488. Alexa 488 stains actin green. Actin is commonly found in mussels, and thus you can see that it is prevalent in a lot of the different organ structures and throughout the entire flatworm body. So that wasn't actually named that for me, it's just a coincidence, but uh, this <laughs> is our next dye, which will stain our nuclei blue. So you can see up here in the head region, there's gonna be more nuclei. And then here, this is the pharynx, which is a very muscle -like structure. And muscle cells are very long, multinucleated, so there will be more in here. And finally, we have an optical sectioning stack. This is, here you can see that we have layered all three of our dyes together and we can compare and contrast where the different concentrations are so you can see where all the actin um, and other structures are located. So as I said, this is the layer hardy genus and we have Megalopleurus, Tetragantha, and Alethoris already described and we are adding Lehardia spiralis. These are going to differ in lots of shapes and sizes within their organs and their overall sizes. The first structure that we use to compare and contrast these species is the proboscis. The proboscis is normally used to, as hooks that will grab prey. And comparing and contrasting the different species, you can see that with ours, they have a longer primary hook and a shorter secondary hook, whereas with the others, it can be an extremely long primary hook or even the same size as ours. So the second structure we looked at is the pharynx, which is kind of like us, a throat, except this can actually be pushed out of the body to reach the prey that are caught on the proboscis hooks. And this is going to be a very muscly region and it's gonna differ in size between our different species. So obviously megalopharynx has a very large pharynx here with 120 micrometers, but it's very large when compared to the size of the body. Tetragantha is a little bit shorter and the allophilus and spiralis are similar compared to their body size with spiralis being 144 micrometers and this is not very large compared to the size of the body. Last but not least, the male organ, consisting of seminal vesicles, the copulatory bulb, the penis, and the penis stylet. This was actually our main differentiator between the species and also the reason we got the name Lehardia spiralis, because the penis stylet for, for Lehardia spiralis is in fact shaped like a spiral. So just to point out some other structures that we didn't really look at for a differentiating factor between species. Um, here at TE, each of these arrows points to a testy, which um, usually there are four to six testes within a flatworm. And we have a hypothesis that these could possibly be single or limited use because we see in older specimens, these can be degraded. And here again is the pharynx, and those are the eye spots of the worm. So what are the future implications of this research? Because we don't know a lot about flatworms and their role in the environment, as well as what their role is in the beach ecosystem and food web, we want to further analyze this to also work on top-down structure to see what their role is as predatory flatworms will have on their prey. So we'd like to acknowledge our mentor, Dr. Julian Smith III from Winthrop, the Winthrop University, UNC Institute of Marine Sciences, our undergraduate lab mates at Winthrop, Abby and Mitchell, and GSSN for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Amazato, for being here.
how long will the process be to have your species named? Um, we are currently in the process of publishing a paper that we've already written, and I don't actually know how long publishing takes, but we did at least get to name it, so, so you guys get to hear it first. <laughs> yeah, it still has to go through under a review of the journal that it will be published in, um, and as long as adding the small finishing details that will be done by some of the undergraduate students. What was the one most challenging thing, thing that you all had to face while doing this research? There was a lot of error that came in with DNA extraction um, that, and because DNA extraction was working very well, we never got amplification within the gels. We also ran into problems with the gels not having the correct solutions of materials, and so we wouldn't receive amplification, which is why we had to go back to live samples to ensure that maybe it wasn't just our old samples that were contributing to this. This led to a little bit of a rush at the end when I had to run through about 40 samples of 25 different combinations each to figure out what they were actually eating. So 